Welcome to the J. Kim Show. This is your host, J. Kim. I am an investor, author, and fitness entrepreneur. And for the first time in Asia, I sit down with the world's most brilliant minds in business, investing, and entrepreneurship. You'll learn all the secrets, strategies, and formulas to becoming a successful entrepreneur directly from the masters. If this is your first time listening, thank you for stopping by. This podcast is produced every week with the goal of providing actionable insight to you, the listener, with every single episode. And now, on to the show. Today's guest is my good friend Drew Manning, who is a former medical technician turned fitness trainer. After being a classic judgmental trainer for many years, you know, the ones that would look at overweight people and call them lazy, Drew came up with a brilliant idea on how to relate better with his clients. And so he made a commitment to stop exercising for six months and follow a restriction-free American diet, which basically gained him 75 pounds in the process. After six months, he switched gears and went through all the pain and lifestyle changes that were needed to get fit again. And during that time, he learned the entire process and struggles of what his clients normally go through. So why do we have a personal trainer on a podcast about entrepreneurship? Well, Drew is clearly a business mastermind. He's a marketing guru, and he's also a New York Times bestselling author. So he shares with us a lot of the secrets and lessons that he learned along the way. I think you guys are gonna find this one very interesting. So let's get right into it. Hey, Drew, thanks for coming on the show. We're really happy to have you. It's been a while since we last spoken, but uh, how are you doing? How's everything going? I'm good, man. It's my pleasure to be on your show, man. Thanks for having me on. Awesome, dude. So for our audience out here in Asia, Drew Manning is quite a well-known uh, f- fitness guy in the States, uh, but maybe you can give us a little bit of background on how you sort of got to where you are. You are an entrepreneur yourself, which is why I wanted to get you on the podcast. So Please tell our, our audience a little bit about yourself. Yeah, you know what's funny? Very interesting, and some people might not know this about me, but I actually have some Asian ancestry in me. My On my dad's side, mm. his great-grandfather was, had the last name Lum Lung, which mm. is Chinese. Okay. And what's so funny is if my great-great-grandmother, uh, he, he, he passed away, and my great-great-grandmother with the last name Lum Lung remarried an Englishman with the last name Manning. So if she didn't remarry that, mm. that Manning, I would be Drew Lum Lung today looking like I do. <laughs> <laughs> I don't look Asian at all, but you know, a lot of people don't know that about me. Ah. Anyways, yeah, my, most people know me from my Fit to Fat to Fit story, which I did about six years ago now. I can't believe how long it's been. But uh, wow. yeah, it kind of went viral online. Basically, in a nutshell, here's what happened. I grew up my entire life in shape in a family of 11 brothers and sisters. I played football and I wrestled and I had this crazy idea as a trainer to better relate to my clients. I decided to let myself go for six months, right? So I stopped exercising, Mm. ate typical American foods, and I gained 75 pounds in six months. And I documented this on my YouTube channel, on my website, and I kind of went viral and got picked up like by the media, went on TV shows like Dr. Oz and Dr. Drew and Good Morning America and Jay Leno. And so, and then ended up writing a book about it. Fast forward to now, this is what I do full time. And I even have a TV show on A&E called Fit to Fat to Fit, where I coach other trainers now to go through this Fit to Fat to Fit process so they can have more empathy, more respect, and a better understanding towards their clients that are overweight. Wow. So so let's take a quick step back. Okay. Uh-huh. So before you came up with this idea, which we'll talk about, obviously, in depth in a bit, so you were, you were always sort of a, a fit guy. You were always into sports, athletics. After you, uh, did you play uh, sports in college? Yes, I played football for three years, and then I wrestled for a couple of those years as well. So yes, football and wrestling were kind of my, my two sports that I did growing up. Okay, and so after you graduated from college, you decided to just jump into the the fitness industry full time. Is that what you? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, basically, what I I, I kind of went all different directions. So basically, I got a job before I even graduated college, working for Chrysler as a financial analyst back in oh, two thousand eight, okay. two thousand nine. So I was in the finance industry, and then worked mm. there for three years, and then from there, the auto industry took a crash in the economy in general, and I had to do a one eighty, and so I went into the medical field. (laughs) So completely all over the place, but I just had a connection and was working as a neuro monitoring technician. But I did Hmm. personal training on the side because during that transition of the finance industry to the medical field, there was about eight months where I couldn't find a job. 
So I got certified as a personal trainer because that's always been my passion, Mm -hmm. you know, health and fitness and, and decided to do personal training on the side while I was doing the medical job full time. And then that's when the idea happened for fit to fat to fit and kind of ran with that idea until I had to make a decision between those two things, right? It went viral and I had a book deal. And so I decided to leave my job in the medical field, which I actually enjoyed a lot, but my passion was more on the health and fitness side. And so I've been doing fit to fat to fit full time since uh, 2011, 2012. Wow, that's incredible. I, I actually didn't know that part of the story. So, <laughs> yeah, a lot so of people don't know that. Yeah, yeah. So that's quite interesting. So you have a fin- finance background. I have a finance background as well. So that, that's actually quite interesting. And I'm sure you probably gathered a, a bit of uh, knowledge and, and, and know-how from your few years doing finance. Uh, but let's, let's talk about the time when you were sort of doing this, this thing on the side, uh, you were working as a technician in the medical field, but you also had a passion in fitness. What were the circumstances at that time that, that sparked this idea of fit to fat fit? Because I think it's fascinating. This is not something that just, you know, you wake up one day and you're like, I'm going <laughs> to, you know, I'm going to go through this radical transformation. I mean, there was there a, a, a certain trigger, something that you saw, something, a client maybe you were working with that really resonated with you and connected with you. And, and you said, I have to do this uh, for this particular client. Like, tell, tell us about that. Yeah. So basically, you know, like I said, I was working in the medical field full time, traveling quite a bit for that job. And then I would have, you know, only two to three clients is what I could manage per week. Mm-hmm. And one of my clients was my brother-in-law at the time. And he was overweight and, you know, here I was a trainer and I was like, yeah, for sure, man, I'll train you. I think I charged him like $10 <laughs> per session, right? Something so cheap. <laughs> and we worked out. And then the problem with me is that growing up with sports and the culture I grew up in, I had a very black and white mentality. Either you do or you do not. There's no try, right? Mm-hmm. And basically, I would get frustrated when we would be at a family event and he would be eating the cake and nachos and pizza. And I'm like, dude, I'm your trainer. I'm watching you eating those foods. Like, you know, those aren't on the meal plan. He's like, oh, it's a party. I'm like, I know, but you have goals, right? And so anyways, I would get frustrated with that, thinking, why is it so hard? Just stop eating the junk food and you'll see Mm -hmm. results. Like, it shouldn't be this hard. And, you know, him and a couple other clients were kind of like, well, you don't understand how hard it is. For you, it's easy because you've always been in shape. And I'm I'm like, you know what? You're right. Maybe I don't understand. And so I felt like there was something I need to learn as a trainer. And so that's when the Mm -hmm. thought process start in my head as far as, okay, what can I do? to have a better understanding, what to relate to my clients. And I know I, I knew I needed to do something online, right? What, cl- training two or three clients per week in person isn't, can't make a full living off that. Right. And I just right. decided to do something online. And I can't remember where I was or when the idea happened. I think it was on one of my road trips for my medical job. But I thought of this idea to get fat on purpose. And I know it sounds crazy to everybody, but it made sense in my mind and it clicked. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I think I'm really going to do this. So I started calling my wife at the time, I called family, friends. I'm like, what do you guys think about this idea? They're like, you should totally do it. <laughs> and so I just kind of was like, oh my gosh. Okay. So I started putting together like a little business plan and, and mapped it all out. I had, I, I had no idea how to start a YouTube channel or create a website. And I just started right. learning all these things. And two to three months later, I was like, okay, I'm going to do it. And I think I, only Facebook was the only popular thing around back then. Twitter mm-hmm. maybe was taken off, but it was so complicated. I'm like, why, you know, why do I need Twitter if I have Facebook? So anyways, right. it was mostly on Facebook at first and then I evolved from there. But that's kind of the story of how it started in a nutshell. That's really fascinating. So I, I, I kind of resonate with you. It, well, okay. So I wasn't always a fitness guy, but I, I think mentally I, I relate with you because I'm kind of, it's like you were saying, you either do it or you don't. And in yeah. my mind, it's like, I, I, I think of it, I categorize it as you're making excuses or you're just going to suck it up and do it. So yeah. for me, it's, it's like, it's binary, it's on or off. It's like, there's no in between. If you're dedicated to a program or dedicated to losing weight or the cutting fat, or whatever your program you're on, you're just going to do it. I don't take excuses. And so I think it's difficult for people like us to really understand the struggles and the plight of people that might not be as um, as mentally disciplined uh, as we are. So I, th- I think it's it's pretty interesting the way that you approach that. Now, 
Also, having said that, as someone that does care about fitness and does and a, a bit vain, you know, I'm, I'm, vanity is, is definitely part mm-hmm. of, of uh, who I am as well. I like to look good and, and lean. For someone to get fat on purpose, I mean, you know, I've gone through uh, many bulks here and there. And, <laughs> and when, I, when I go from sort of single digit body fat to even to creeping up to, you know, 14, 15 percent, I emotionally, it's difficult for me, you know, to see myself like that because you see, you know, you see your, yourself progressing mm-hmm. the other way from all the hard work that you've been doing. So that must have been quite challenging for you. Um, so tell us a little bit about that process. I mean, I think that I think it's OK. First of all, it's fascinating that you spotted the trend in, in technology and, and online. So that's that's good. And you definitely capitalize on that. Now, when you were going through this process, I mean, you must have been, first of all, it must have been very difficult for you being a fitness guy altogether. So how, how did you feel <laughs> during this six-month transformation? Yeah, it, that's the thing. It was so humbling. It was way harder than I ever thought it would be. Because here's the thing, you know, I can relate to you because you associate your identity with what your body looks like. Most people do. Whether they're skinny or fit or overweight, that's kind of part of your, your identity. When you change that, you lose that. Like when I lost my six pack and I gained all this fat, mm-hmm. I freaked out. I'm like, what? Right. Like, this isn't me. I wanted to go up to complete strangers and say, hey, I'm not really overweight. Like, this isn't really <laughs> what I look like. Like, here's an old picture of me. And what? I, this is just an experiment. Yeah, yeah. And because I freaked out and I just associated who I was with what my body looked like. And when that was gone, I didn't really know who I was. And so it was very hard mentally and emotionally. Physically, I knew I was going to get fat right man boobs and a big gut i knew that was going to happen but i (laughs) i didn't realize how much it would affect me on the mental and emotional level so i'd be super self-conscious in front of my wife at the time you know i'd cover up and Mm -hmm. you know stepping out of the shower or you know anytime we were intimate the lights were always off like i just i didn't want to see myself naked and i didn't want her to see me naked so it was it was so much harder than i ever imagined it would be and that's what kind of my book goes into is those lessons of the things that i learned and a different perspective going through this journey. And I learned so many valuable lessons along the way that even though it was humbling and it was way harder than I thought it would be, I wouldn't take it back for anything. Like I have no regrets doing it because I learned so many valuable lessons to where now I can relate to my clients so much better. They can relate to me so much better uh, because they used to tell me all the time that I was just another trainer with a six pack. And what did I know Mm -hmm. about them and their journey? And so now they're like, man, I feel like you, like you kind of came down to our levels, what they would tell me. And I think people could relate to that so much more. Yeah, I think it's awesome because that, that's a big thing. That's, that, that actually was uh, the reason when I was, you know, years ago, I, I was always resistant against using personal trainers because I thought of them as, you know, as you, know, you don't understand the plight, right? The struggles that a normal person goes through or, or it's kind of like, oh, well, you do this full time. So if I had all day to work out and be a personal trainer, I'd look like you too, right? Yeah. So what was the worst, single worst part about being overweight or fat, if you will? I mean, was it the emotional side of it or was it the actual, like how you felt physically? Like, cause I, I know that if I, you know, if I'm, if I go out for a week on a vacation, I eat, garbage i just i physically don't feel good either right it was a, it was a combination of both because here's the thing they kind of they go hand in hand because for example i had so much lack of energy and feeling lethargic all the time to where it affected my sleep so i, I would snore i started mm. about two months in and when your sleep is affected your hormones are affected right and when your hormones are out of whack that kind of leads you into the mental and emotional side of you being grumpy or moody based off of those physical those physical changes happening And so they kind of go hand in hand, in my opinion. So, yeah, I would say it was more so on the mental and emotional side. Like physically, I didn't I I was big, but I didn't feel like I was dying. Right. I I just felt like, man, I just have so I just have so little energy to do stuff to help out around the house, play with my kids. Um, You know, just feeling lazy is the way I felt all the time. Um, But I think the hardest part for me was was being this overweight person out in public and kind of seeing what it's like. Not that I had a complete understanding. But I could kind of see what it was like for some of my clients being out in public. No one was ever mean to me or judged me or said mean things to me. But I remember, mm-hmm. you know, the stares I got, um, you know, going to the grocery store and filling up my cart with a bunch of junk food. I felt like people were looking at my stomach a little bit differently and like, you know, 
are they judging me? Are they not? Like, this is so yeah. hard for me. I wanted this to tell people <laughs> this is an experiment and I couldn't <laughs> do it. And so it was, it was a combination of both, but they go hand in hand, in my opinion. Yeah, because it's, it's th- those sort of things you normally don't, you wouldn't even be self-conscious. I mean, if someone's looking at you when you're just walking around, you, you would never ever in your mind be like, oh, he's looking at me because I'm overweight. Exactly. You know, that, that just <laughs> wouldn't be in that data set, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's so true, man. So there must have been a fair share of criticism that you, that you had to encounter when you went through this transformation. Tell us about some of the things that, you know, I mean, I, I'm talking about, you know, people saying, oh, well, this is a marketing hoax or, oh, you know, this is, he's, he's out of line. He shouldn't do this. You know, why is he doing this on purpose? Blah, blah, blah. I mean, there must have been some sort of criticism somewhere, right? Oh, yeah, I know. Mean, yeah. There definitely was. But I'll say this, 90 90- percent of the time 90 to 95 percent of it was positive the five to ten percent was people who didn't understand why i was doing it like if they just saw a picture on like yahoo.com right which is when it went viral they're like mm-hmm. personal trainer is getting obese or something like that people would be like what the hell like that's stupid why is this guy doing it like doesn't make yeah. sense like an idiot yeah it's just he's doing it for marketing for fame but then mm-hmm. once they saw my videos on youtube and read my blogs and understood why i was doing it then they were more understanding and empathetic towards, okay, this guy's really trying to understand better. He's trying to uh, relate to his clients and he's being humbled through this process. Like he's not making fun of people who are overweight. He's not saying, look, I can do it. So can you, that's not, that wasn't the point of it. So I I feel like once people understood why I was doing it, then it made more sense in their mind and they weren't as harsh or critical. But if they just saw a picture, you know, before and after like, Oh, what an idiot versus if they actually took the time to read my my blogs and watch my videos, they could kind of see how it changed me and how it humbled me and how it changed my perspective of how I train clients. Right. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I, I, um, you're, you're actually like a meme now. Like, I, I think I was like <laughs> Bora the other day, just answering some questions, and I saw you was like, oh, what, what can happen in six months? And I saw, I saw your, yeah, your transformation. It's quite cool. So, so tell us about. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the the business side of things. So. When you came up across this idea, obviously a brilliant idea on your road trip that you came up with, and I think it's fascinating seeing how that has, you've just parlayed that into an incredible business with obviously a best-selling book, and now you have a TV show. So initially when you started, you started off just as a blog, documenting your journey uh, on YouTube. At what point did you, you said you were at a crossroads, at what point did you have to, okay, I'm going to give up my day job and do this full time. Were you actually making any sort of income at that time? I mean, th- this was this was early on when you had just started uh, documenting or was it after the journey? No, this was during while I was documenting it. But it wasn't until about four months into my fit to fat journey that things started to take off. I mean, in the beginning, I had some ads on my website, you know, and maybe made like 100 bucks a month, <laughs> you know, from right. from these kind of Google ads on my website. Mm-hmm. And then one day, it got one of these bl- fitness blog- bloggers blogged about me, and Yahoo.com picked it up and posted it on their homepage on Yahoo.com, like right where the news articles are. And that's wow. when things blew up. That's when every TV show called me and, and wanted to book me for their show. And then that's when I got a call from this publishing firm, HarperCollins, and said, hey, we've mm-hmm. read through your blogs. We've seen your journey. We think it's amazing. We think it, should, it would be a great book. Where Would you be interested? So we, I, I had no idea. So that all just came to you. You didn't actually have, you didn't, you weren't actually soliciting no. uh, press or anything like that. No. I mean, I, I did like some free press releases, which I don't know if anybody even <laughs> sees those, but Right, right, I never right. got any responses from those. I, I didn't have a marketing strategy. I didn't have connections. I didn't have any big plans for this to take off, to be honest with you. I thought maybe the local news here in Utah would pick it up. But to be honest with you, I do feel very fortunate and blessed that this kind of you know went viral. And, and I feel lucky in a way, for sure. And so, yeah, the TV show started calling and started doing all these TV shows and you know, I would be in surgeries and then I remember my phone would have to be off during surgeries. And so <laughs> when I would get out, I would be, my phone would be blown up with voicemails and text messages like, dude, I saw you on yahoo.com. And like everybody was like friends that I haven't talked to in years are like, oh my gosh, I saw what you're doing. Like it just kind of was crazy. And um, I didn't have any expectations for that. And so once the book deal happened, I felt like, okay, if I'm going to write this book in, I think I had three or four months to write it, <laughs> which, That's it? you know, wow. yeah, because I had to write it during the journey while I was doing it. 
and it had to be ready and published by the time I lost all the weight. And so it was so much work. So I knew I had to choose between my my medical job or fit to fat fit and so i chose fit to fat fit and here we are six years later did you have like savings or i mean you basically then you just gave up your job and you were going to dedicate i mean was there a book advance that you could at least you know keep the lights on with yeah or no there like there was a book advance which definitely helped out and then my wife at the time she she had a job as well and so and, and i didn't just quit that day it was like okay i'll help train the, the new person that comes in to replace me and i would it wasn't working as much, but I was still, you know, I had that for about a month while I started writing my book. So yes, there was some things there. It wasn't like a huge leap of faith where I'm like, okay, I think I'm going to go this route without any kind of income or advance from the book. But that's kind of how it went down. Okay, cool. And so fast for that. So that was your, your book and the journey was 2012 or 11. Is that what you said? Doesn't, uh, 12 is when I finished it. I started it in May, May 7th of 2011. May 5th of 2012 was my ending date. Okay, cool. And so let's talk about after that. So fast forward, after the book and the transformation, and now that you've done that round trip, being someone that was in fitness, it's very easy for, for people like us on, on this side of things to, to call overweight people lazy and and be more judgmental about how we view people and their discipline and their fitness and their priorities in life. How has that all changed for you now that you've been on the other side and you understand the struggles and the plight of someone that is overweight and the, the not only the, the physical changes that happen, but the emotional changes that happen along, alongside that journey? How do you feel differently now about how you view your clients. Yeah, so just kind of put it into perspective. Before, I used to focus so much more on the physical side of transformation and weight loss. If someone was struggling to lose weight, I'd be like, all right, let's push harder in the gym. Let's change up your workouts. Let's look at your meal plan. Let's look at your food journal. And that's mm -hmm. what all of it was about. I was like, okay, this is, this is the key right here. But in reality, I had no idea the mental and emotional trials that people went through until I went through this journey. Because before, like I said, I couldn't understand why people couldn't let go of their junk food until I did it. And I tried to get yeah. off of it. And it was one of the hardest things I've ever done. It was like getting off of drugs. Your body goes through these withdrawal symptoms and there's the, the emotional connection to food is so much more powerful than I ever imagined. And so after going through this process and this journey, uh, one of the biggest things I learned was how much of transformation is mental and emotional way more than physical, right? You need the meal plans, you need the exercises. Everybody knows they need to eat health, healthy and exercise. And there's some hacks you can do there to, to maximize that. Mm -hmm. But the struggle is on the mental and emotional side. And that's what I focus on now so much more when I help out clients. I mean, I don't train people one-on-one -on -one anymore, but all mm -hmm. my programs online focus more on the mental and emotional side. And the TV show, that's what I'm trying to get these other trainers who – have grown up in shape and are kind of self-obsessed and judgmental like I was trying to get them to change their per perception of how they view their clients and, and the struggles that they go through because there's a huge gap that exists there in my opinion in the fitness world of these skinny fit people who think it's so easy right you just eat less and yeah. you move more when in reality there's so much more to it and that's why there's such a huge divide in my opinion and so with my fit to fit to fit movement is what I call it through the TV show and through my brand. I'm trying to help bridge that gap by coaching other trainers through this process on the TV show to gain a better understanding of the mental and emotional side um, by doing this fit to fit to fit journey. That's awesome. So what are some of the things that you specifically like to focus on on the mental side and the emotional side? Like uh -huh. when you approach a client or a client approaches you for the first time, you know, forget about the tactics, uh, jumping into the workouts and, and the diet and nutrition plans. What are some of the first things that you focus on? The two biggest things would be support and accountability. So a support system and being accountable to uh, someone else other than themselves, right? A lot of people just try and jump in and do it themselves. Like, okay, this year I'm going to lose 100 pounds and I'm just going to work out every day and not eat sugar or drink soda ever again. And they just try and do it by themselves because they are afraid of, they tell people and they don't follow through, then they're afraid of that that failure. But that fear is actually very powerful. So I, I tell people to announce to their friends, family, and online community, if you will, uh, their intentions, their goals of what they want to mm -hmm. accomplish. Because then that makes them accountable 
Because then those people, their friends, family, or community online are going to help keep them accountable during that process because there's going to be days where they want to quit and they want to give up and it's going to be hard and they don't want to do it anymore. And then they have those people, that support system to remind them um, that they are worth it to continue to fight for their health, that they are worth it to not necessarily be skinny or, or be fit, but to become healthy. And that's what the support system does and staying accountable to a community will do for people versus just giving them meal plans and exercises. I tell people, look, you know, whether you're paleo, vegan, you know, keto, vegetarian, whatever it is, find what works for you and make it a lifestyle change. Don't just say, I'm going to do this for 30 days and lose a bunch of weight and then gain it back again. Find what works for you, make it a lifestyle change. And the way to make it a lifestyle change is by overcoming those mental and emotional challenges. And in order to do that, you need a support system and accountability along the way otherwise if you try and do it by yourself it's so much harder yeah it's fitness is all about accountability for sure let's yeah. switch gears and talk about your sort of personal rituals habits as an entrepreneur what are what are some of the things that you do on a daily basis that just help keep you going um, obviously fitness is a big thing you know I, I work out nearly every day i imagine you do as well i find it one of the best productivity hacks that any entrepreneur uh, can do because I work out in the morning and you know my mind is just on fire after that talk t tell us about some of your daily rituals and habits what do you do on a daily basis that helps you be successful as an entrepreneur yeah one of the things that I preach not only in the fitness world but also in the entrepreneur world is a healthier you is a happier you and so um, if you can find ways to make time for yourself throughout the day you're going to be a better version of yourself as a, a mom or a dad or a spouse or an employee or as an entrepreneur if you take the time, even though we think we're sacrificing or we're being selfish, if we sacrifice our time to work out or meditate or do positive affirmations or sit down and read a book, we think, I just need to be grinding so hard, you know, 12, 14 hours a day. Uh, when in reality, if you learn how to uh, work out smarter in the gym or on your business, you're, it's going to give you more return on investment, in my opinion, uh, versus just grinding until you eventually crash and burn. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's exact. Yeah, the the analogy that you give in the gym is exactly the same. You know, people spin their wheels <laughs> doing hours of cardio and think that that's the most effective way, but it's not, right? Yes, exactly. And so, yeah, a couple things that I do. Yeah, I do take the time to meditate every morning. I I try and focus on things that, that help me with discipline. So, for example, I know it's weird, but I make my bed every morning, mm -hmm. which I, I don't think that makes me a better entrepreneur. But at the same time, I know that I'm going to do that every single day, just like I'm going to meditate, do my positive affirmations, just like I'm going to go to the gym, just like I'm going to eat healthy that day. And that helps to keep me on track by staying disciplined with just small and simple things, which you wouldn't think really makes a difference. But in the end, it's those small and simple things that make the biggest difference. Being an entrepreneur, there's it's ups and downs, ups and downs. I mean, I, I don't I can't think of a day that I've <laughs> gone through in the last, you know, several years where I haven't had peaks and troughs emotionally of things that, you know, oh, I got, you know, featured on a blog or or I got some good news or some good momentum. And then, oh, you know, I got another rejection. How do you deal with failure uh, consistently on a daily basis? Is there any sort of tricks that you do to dig yourself out of the the, the emotional uh, troughs that that all entrepreneurs go through? Yeah, that's a great question. And trust me, I've been through a lot of failures in the past five or six years. I know I don't have time to cover all of them, but I've learned so many humbling lessons from an entrepreneurial standpoint of what to do and what not to do. And so I've I've had a lot of headaches and stressful moments. But one one book that comes to mind that's helped me out with that is called uh, Loving What Is. And I can't remember the author's name, but it totally changed my perception of kind of beating yourself up of, of living in the past of those failures and be like, man, I, this could have happened. This should have happened. This would have happened. And, you know, all, we beat ourselves up all the time about those past mm -hmm. failures. And since then, I've just been able to let go of, of what is and love it the way it is because that was meant to happen for a reason. Maybe still learn some lessons from it and apply you know, what I could do differently in the future. But at the same time, I choose not to live in the past because if I live in the past, that just is going to set me up for feeling guilty or ashamed or uh, like a failure uh, versus living in the moment. And that's why things like meditation, positive affirmations and reading books, I think, in my opinion, helps out in those situations of dealing with failure. So you can choose how you how you view it, though. I think that's a, the key right there is that we have the ability to choose how we view that failure um, and trust me, I know it's fighting against human nature to feel like a failure when you have failed, but failure is a part of success, right? And you don't yeah, become absolutely. successful unless you fail. It's a part of it, right? It's just like working out. You don't mm -hmm. get fit 
unless you're sore, you, you know, are, are working out in the gym, doing something that, that is uncomfortable, that is hard sometimes. And it's the same mentality in, in, in the entrepreneurial world as well. Absolutely. It's so powerful if you are able to reframe that mindset. You know, Tony Robbins says life happens for you, not to you. Right. Yes. And he talks about how all the failures and all the hardship that he went through in his life made him who he is today. And I mean, that's exactly what entrepreneurs have to do. So, Drew, um, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you're working on these days? Uh, you know, what what you have in, in the pipeline for 2017 and you know where people can sort of find you follow you connect with you if there's anything that um that you're working on specifically that might interest our audience yeah so first thing big announcement season two of fit to Pets fit will be airing this spring i'm not sure when this episode nice. will air but uh sometime in april or may we don't have a set date yet we're just finishing filming the f- last couple months of the season so be looking for that on a and e it's called fit to Pets to fit and awesome. then I recently launched a couple of programs on my website. If you go to fit to fit to fat to fit.com with, with the numbers two, with the mm-hmm. number two, FIT number two, FAT number two, FIT.com. I have a six month transformation program, which kind of, you know, I talked about support and accountability. Uh, you get access to a private Facebook group with me and my team of other people going through the journey as well. And so you can share your uh, successes, your struggles, your failures along the way, um, which I think is super powerful for people as they begin any type of fitness journey. But it's a complete physical, mental, and emotional transformation journey. That's at transform.fit2fat2fit.com. And then all my other programs you can just find on my website, fit2fat2fit.com. And then follow me on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, everything <laughs> at fit awesome. to fat to fit all the same with the number two nice awesome drew thanks so much for being on the show um yeah guys you know i mean drew is the man he obviously obviously has proven that he can get you from <laughs> overweight to, to lean again he's done the round trip journey so go over fit to fat to fit.com i will link it up all in the show notes drew it was awesome catching up with you thanks again for your time thanks jay appreciate it man have a good one all right take care I hope you enjoyed today's episode. All the show notes and links can be found over at jkimshow.com. Come back often and make sure you subscribe, rate, and review. Don't forget to join us next week for another exciting episode of The J. Kim Show. I'd love to hear your comments. You can find me on Twitter at jkimmer, J-A-Y-K-I-M-M-E-R. See you guys next week. This podcast is brought to you by Hack Your Fitness, the high achiever's guide to getting ripped in under three hours a week. If you're anything like me, you're probably working a full-time job or jobs and trying to find time to balance family life, social life, and last but not least, fitness. Look, I get it. I'm a full-time investor and entrepreneur myself and father of two. So how am I able to stay fit year-round without spending hours and hours in the gym killing myself on the cardio machine? After struggling for the last 15 years trying every workout and diet under the sun, I finally designed a system that allows me to achieve and maintain single-digit body fat for life in under 3 hours a week. Cardio not required. Head on over to hackyour.fitness and download my free 13-page guide that teaches you the simple science behind efficient fitness and smart nutrition and gives you everything you need to know to finally take control of your life. That's hackyour.fitness.